Uh, greetings to those listening on Ophthal 2020 virtual. And uh, over the next 25, 30 minutes, I'll be talking to you about uh, some of the issues that we faced in building an institute like the Institute of Ophthalmology uh, for, its, for its activities inside Nepal and outside Nepal. If you look at the blindness picture, uh, uh, you know, you see about 36 million people who are really blind with a crude prevalence uh, rate of 0.48, and of which uh, as much as 13 million people are blind due to cataract. And uh, unfortunately, 89% of these visually impaired people live in low and middle income countries. And uh, by far, the most important and leading cause of cataract continues to be, uh, leading cause of blindness continues to be cataract. When we started in the beginning, uh, you know, it was way back in 1984. And uh, those days, uh, the, uh, the practice of uh, cataract surgery was intracapsular cataract extraction. And uh, it was, uh, uh, you know, it was interesting to notice uh, that about 60% of the uh, patients who were operated didn't actually wear glasses, so they were functionally blind. And uh, you could get severe in coordination with the FAK glasses. And also because of poor quality of surgery, because of, you know, uh, unavailability of better microscopes and other things, uh, there were uh, lots of iatrogenic blindness as high as 6% after cataract surgery. And uh, we decided uh, uh, way back uh, at the outset that our mission is going to be uh, to uh, provide sufficient in terms of numbers, successful in terms of quality, and sustainable, uh, you know, in terms of management of modern cataract surgery to the community. And uh, we found, you know, and we studied some of the barriers at that time, and we found that uh, one important barrier way back at that time, not now, of course, was the cost of high quality intraocular lenses which are not available in this part of the world. And they used to cost more than $100. And uh, adaptation of good quality surgical technique for the situation in our, in our part of the world, simple, appropriate surgical technology. And of course, the cost and complexity of the associated equipments and consumables. And uh, we started working and playing around with very simple, low-cost microscopes with added uh, illuminations in the beginning. You know, we did a couple of pilot studies with different types of simple, low-cost microscopes because the cost of microscope was a big issue in taking this surgery to the community. And uh, in 1990, 91, we published uh, one of the first results uh, of extracapsular surgery with lens implantation in a, in a developing country. And uh, this produced, of course, a lot of international debate. And, uh, you, know, and uh, you know, a lot of uh, ophthalmic personnel around the world looked and talked about its appropriateness uh, whether time is right for us to you know, start on with intraocular lens implantation or not. And uh, so we were pressed with uh, uh, you know, streamlining uh, the whole process of uh, surgical technique and surgical system. So it took us nearly five years to simplify, adapt and test it and also published uh, internationally. And uh, we managed to, uh, you know, make standard operating manuals. And thereby it was, it was easy for us to take this surgical technique to other parts of the world in Asia and Africa. And the other barrier was the cost of the intraocular lenses. So way back in 1994, we were able to uh, do lots of uh, trial and error and finally able to manufacture world-class intraocular lenses. 
and these lenses were these single piece lenses were being uh, manufactured for a cost of as low as less than four dollars and of course later on we uh, went into the dynamism of newer newer products into foldable lenses and the whole thing was that the surgery and the type of the surgery now came within the reach of the large poor community also because the cost of the intraocular lenses was affordable now the cataract surgery available uh, even now but at that time the first was conventional extracapsular extraction with intraocular lens implantation of course now this is not done and uh, you know this was safe but much better options were available in terms of outcome and phaco emulsification safe fantastic outcomes not applicable for all types of cataracts we find in this part of the world very difficult for very complex cataracts and of course the higher costs you know manual small incision and cataract surgery it was safe cost effective great outcome but still there's a training complexity so we started uh, uh, you know in order to in order to fight the barriers of providing good quality cataract surgery we did a modify the small incision cataract surgery which was then called uh, mini nucleus extraction by blumenthal where he started he how he was doing it in an office as an office procedure so we modified the whole surgical technique and the system for this to be applicable in a large volume uh, and at the community level so it was manif it was modified and applied at the community so it started to become simple low cost with extremely good results and uh, again uh, there was a bit of a uh, confusion and uh, and criticism for manual small incision cataract surgery so we were landed up uh, you know by uh, landed up in in uh, proceeding to do a randomized clinical trial with small incision cataract surgery versus phaco emulsification we did this in nepal two surgeons had about 150 cases randomized the cases and followed them for one year so it was left to david chang and me to process uh, uh, with uh, this surgery and uh, we looked at the post-op results and uh, you know consistently over the period of one year we found the visual equity uh, and the outcomes were comparable in the two types of surgery and uh, the fact that uh, the phaco emulsification was a lot expensive in terms of its you know consumables and capital costs and uh, smaller than cataract surgery was much smaller cost some of the results that you see with uh, small lenses and uh, cataract surgery with temporal section they actually do much uh, much better than we all think so with the final system fine-tuned uh, we decided to take this uh, system around the world and trained and uh, over the period of time more than 49 countries doctors have come to learn this technique in nepal and tilganga and we have disseminated it into different continents because it is simple low cost still with very good outcome and uh, as uh, in Vietnam, we started uh, training the local doctors in 1990s. In China, in mid 90s, and we continue to do this. In Thailand, we started, uh, you know, uh, saying that one of the options of cataract surgery uh, is small incision cataract surgery, which can also give good results, and sometimes as good as the phaco emulsification and uh, dpr you know formerly known as north korea indonesia lots of uh, you know high volume uh, surgical demonstrations trainings not only to the surgeon but the whole team and uh, then they see uh, the efficiency the outcome and the safety of the surgery if you keep up the protocol of standard operating procedure for quality assurance in Nepal, we continue. We are continuing to do this in different parts of Nepal. In Myanmar, 
in some parts of India, different parts of Africa, especially Ethiopia, Sudan, Ghana, Tanzania. Now, uh, you know, I believe uh, that uh, the future of temporal section, good quality, small incisions and cataract surgery still valid for a few years. It still gives, continues to give good results and uh, you need to do, you need to train them well. And uh, if you do that, and the results are still good and for set, you know, I mean, it can give results to almost all types of cataract, but especially appropriate for cataracts, which are complex and difficult with fecal emulsification. And this is just a pictorial uh, steps of uh, small incisions and cataract surgery. You can see. Uh, The FACO emulsification, uh, you know, results are fantastic. And uh, we cannot still continue not to uh, ignore the fact the cost is high. Training is not very easy and and cost of cost and complexity of equipment is still there. But by far, uh, this is uh, established to be the technique of choice. And uh, for our part of the world, surgeons trained in both FACO and SICS is really the most appropriate thing because they can handle all types of cataract in all situations. Now, Himalayan Cataract Project and Tilganga, uh, you know, continued very strongly to transfer this model of not only uh, uh, surgical technique and surgical delivery system, but also of the eye care to different parts of the world. For example, Myanmar, Indonesia, Bhutan, Cambodia, Ghana, Ethiopia, Cameroon, Nigeria, and many other parts of the world. We continue to do this with our colleagues to share what we have learned here in Nepal. And uh, just a matter of uh, sharing with you some of the non-government, non-ophthalmological uh, issues. Uh, when we build a hospital and when we run a hospital, it's very important that a hospital needs to be run very efficiently. Even a community hospital needs to have a very good governance and extremely important to have great team building. And we have to look at sustainability. Very important. And quality assurance is very important. We need to constantly audit both surgical surgical the system and uh, also for the hospital management and of course the inventory yeah but i want to really emphasize that governance is very important even when you are running community eye hospital now with the uh, you know advent recently of covid uh, community programs have become more difficult and we continue to look for models. And one of the models that we're looking at is Community Eye Hospital. And I want to share a little bit about these Community Eye Hospitals to you. These are smaller, achievable, autonomous, sustainable, high quality at the community level, uh, catching a population catchment area of about a million of people. And they are scalable models. The models are very scalable, so we can reduplicate it in other parts. Three to four flows, costing in capital, in total of between 2.5 to $3 million for land, infrastructure, equipments, and first three years of running cost. And thereby, it will start to become meet the operating cost and run, uh, run more or less. Um, you know, it's, it has been proven that it will run very well after that. At the community eye hospital level, uh, you know, it's very important that we deliver high quality cataract surgery, both phaco emulsification and small incision and cataract surgery. And it's very important to address the most common cause of visual impairment that is refractive error, including giving very smart and correct and qualitative refractive checkups, including optical dispensing, very important. And some services of medical retina glaucoma, especially for diabetic retinopathy. 
and periodical subspecialty services, training programs, and community screening at the catchment area at the grassroots level. And again, this has to be built on a business plan and quality assurance, and uh, you know, it needs to be audited regularly. And team building, like I said, is very important. It's very important that the team feel on, take ownership and there's a bit of a passion. And I always believe that uh, uh, passion or love for one's job is very important. Uh, probably one of the most important thing uh, for a facility to run and leadership uh, for a community eye hospital. Strategic management plan, you make it for two years or four years, but it's always very important that you understand what you're planning ahead. Some of the uh, community eye hospitals that we've been running in Xining in Qinghai, China, Hetaura in Nepal, and this is always taken as a, uh, as a model where we have uh, achieved, uh, you know, about uh, meeting the operating cost and starting to make profit and expanding services now very quickly. In Kalimpong in northeastern India, smaller, but still very, very efficient, delivering very high quality eye care at that place and still staying sustainable. Now, recently built hospital in Bhutan. The Tilganga itself, <coughs> um, you know, there's a surgery center which, uh, in which we see inside the hospital about uh, 1,000 patients, but the subsidiary of Tilganga around uh, Nepal uh, sees on an average about 2,000 patients a day. The Fred Hollows Intraocular Lens Lab, which manufactures both single piece and foldable intraocular lenses uh, for the last 25 years now, and uh, in distributing all around the world. Low cost, high quality intraocular lenses. Nepal Eye Bank, which is, you know, retrieving corneas and distributing high quality corneas again. A very efficient training and education academics. Research. We continue to do a lot of good research. Some great researches are done on, uh, you know, cataract, uh, fecal emulsification, small system cataract surgery, on glaucoma, epidemiology of glaucoma and diabetic retinopathy. So a lot of good researches are being done. And recently, we're doing research, continuing to do. Uh, this research is continuing to look at the presence of presence of COVID. Uh, from the swap cultures in the conjunctival sac. And uh, we are halfway across, and I'm sure it's going to be useful to the ophthalmic fraternity around the world. And uh, one of our important and passionate program is always a community outreach program. And this is the center where uh, uh, we have a world-class operating theater. And at one time, uh, about eight surgeons, eight different rooms are uh, running, doing different forms of uh, ophthalmic surgery. Intraocular lens, uh, uh, along with the Fred Hollows Foundation, now totally managed by the Nepalese in Nepal. It's made to, you know, we're manufacturing high quality intraocular lenses locally. Again, like I said, uh, you know, we, uh, we have been able to uh, bring down the cost to less than $4 for single piece lenses and uh, continue to manufacture lenses of modern designs and modern types and types of surgery now have come within the reach of poor community. And these are uh, very stringently uh, quality assured by SGS for CE mark. And until now, we have distributed 6 million lenses to 80 countries. Another, uh, you know, cap in the of uh, in Tilganga's uh, uh, wings uh, is the eye bank, and uh, you know when uh, starting Tilganga, we always started in a very difficult situation, so we had to face a lot of difficulties in the beginning, a lot of obstacles. So we uh, are pretty good, and uh, you know, in thinking a little bit out of the box. And uh, for example, uh, this cornea excision room, which we have played right, placed right at the crematorium in Paspati, uh, is probably one of the only one cornea excision room in a crematorium. 
and uh, this actually is, is you know it it uh, serves uh, not only for us to excise cornea aseptically in a crematorium but also creates lots of public awareness uh, and uh, you know this has been a successful uh, public awareness program for us for retrieving corneas and uh, if you look at uh, the uh, cornea uh, harvesting for suitable corneas. Last year, we harvested uh, more than 1,100 corneas, and Nepal now is self-sufficient self in corneas. And we even sent our corneas to other countries. And the corneas that we get are of extremely good quality because our death to existence time is very short. And uh, this is another public awareness program that is out of the box again. And uh, this is a annual uh, condolence meeting that we um, uh, organize and whereby we create a little plaque uh, where the uh, names of all those who have donated corneas are written down. And uh, you know the, the grieving families, they are uh, invited to come and join these condolence meetings. So they come and uh, look at the plaque, look at the uh, place where their uh, you know, loved ones' uh, uh, our names are inscribed, and they'll lit a lamp there and uh, pay homage, and maybe you know, draw a few you know, drops of tear. And it's very moving. It's very moving, and it's a very powerful public awareness tool for eye banking. And if you look at the, the, uh, the proportion of intraocular lens for cataract patients in Nepal, 1994 had always been a landmark when Tilganga was established. And uh, the uh, number of patients with intraocular lenses started really shooting up. And uh, of course, uh, you know, we were one of the first countries in this uh, region to have high proportion of intraocular lens in the, uh, in the cataract patients very early on. This had been possible because of the manufacture of low-cost intraocular lenses and by having a very simple, appropriate, good quality surgical technique and system. And uh, the causes of blindness, uh, you know, between 1981 and 2010. In 1981, Nepal conducted uh, a very famous uh, national blindness survey where multi-strata uh, survey, multidisciplinary survey was done in the country to find the magnitude and distribution of blindness. And we found uh, cataract to be about 72% of the blindness. And prevalence of blindness was 0.84 for people who are uh, blind, uh, less than three by 60 in the better eye. And in 2010, the blindness uh, prevalence had almost halved, less than halved. It was 0.35%. And then, you know, um, uh, uh, other emerging causes of uh, blindness started coming up. Glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, retinal disease, ARMD, refractive errors, they are emerging now. And if you look at the uh, cataract surgical rate, again, uh, 1994, the establishment of Tilunga is really a landmark when our uh, cataract surgical rate was less than 500 uh, surgeries per million population per year. It's now close to 5,000 per year per million population. So this uh, is a significant uh, uptake of good quality cataract surgery in the whole country. Yeah. If you look at the eye care in Nepal, we devoted uh, the first decade but in 1980 and 1990, to look at the National Blindness Survey that I mentioned to you to find the magnitude and distribution of blindness. And then we looked at, uh, you know, emphasizing building infrastructure and uh, producing human resources, ophthalmic personnel, paramedics, and ophthalm ophthalmologists. In 1991-2000, infrastructure continued, human resources, quality service, and technology. 2001 to 2010, human resources continue. Service coverage, sustainability, technology, infrastructure. In 2011 and 2020, subspecialty trainings. And 
Ophthalmology started getting more comprehensive. We started looking at cornea, we started looking at glaucoma and diabetic retinopathy and retinal diseases, pediatric ophthalmology and uh, uveitis, oculoplasty, etc. cetera, neuro-ophthalmology. And a lot of emphasis is given now on research and documentation, monitoring and evaluation and sustainability, quality assurance. Thank you very much for staying with me and uh, uh, thank you very much for allowing me to speak to you. And I hope uh, in an unprecedented time like this, I just want to uh, you know, say lots of love and empathy and uh, hope we all come out of this safe and sound and we'll go back to our patients. Thank you very much. <laughs>